happened many times where someone would come to the mosque of Rasulullah and they can't tell who's Rasulullah. Why? Because first of all, there's no cameras, there's no pictures, right? If you have never seen him, you don't know how he looks like. And second of all, because Rasulullah was so down to earth, he did not want a space specifically for him, designated for him. He would sit every day one place until there were some complaints from uh, many people, Muslims, that, you know, we want you to sit on a mimbar so that we can all see you, hear you. If you're sitting with us, it's difficult for the people in the back. Anyway, but this shows the humility of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he asked them, which one of you is Rasulullah? They say, this is Rasulullah. He goes to him, he says, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I need to tell you something, but privately. He goes to the side, what do you need? He tells him something. Then the Prophet looks at his ashab, his companions, and he tells them these words. He says, Man minkum yuzawwidu al a'rabi. Who amongst you can help this a'rabi and give him zad? That a'rabi, that Bedouin, ask Rasulullah for some zad. What is zad? So that basically is food and water, what you need during a trip. Back then when you travel, your trip will take a couple of days going from one city to a city. Why? Because you're traveling on horses and mules and camels. And there are no restaurants on the way. There are, there's nothing, just desert. So you have to take everything that you need for the trip. All the water you need, all the food, whatever you need. Even your tent, you have to carry it with you. So he wants Zad, basically food and water. Now, Zad isn't that important when you travel because there's food everywhere. Even on the plane, they'll bring you the nicest meal that you probably don't even eat in your house, especially if you're flying business class. So now it's not that important. You just got to make sure you have uh, your credit card, some cash, khalas. Everything is, is available everywhere now. So he asked Zad for Rasulullah to go back to his city, town, wherever it is. And it'll probably take him a couple of days. So he wants food enough for a couple of days. Rasulullah looks to his companions. He tells them, Man minkum Who can help this Arabi and give him food? Now, why didn't Rasulullah give him? Because the Prophet wanted to give his companions a chance to help this man. Because we are told, this is, look, this is what's beautiful about Islam. We are told by Islam, our teachings, that when you help a poor person, he has a favor on you, not you have a favor on him. Think about it in this mentality. If someone comes and asks me for money, I give him $20. Who is the one that has the favor on the other? Most people say, well, me, I gave him, he's the beggar. He's the one that's asking, even if he's not a beggar, but it's a friend that I helped. I am the one that did the favor. The ahadith tell us it's the other way around. He's the one that did you a favor by allowing you to help him. How? Do you know how much you benefit you gain from helping someone? Do you know how much in the dunya and in the akhirah? The benefits of sadaqah? When you help someone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will keep away so much bala from you, the ahadith say. So much bad things that can happen to you, sadaqah will protect you from those bad things. This is the beauty of sadaqah. It purifies your heart, your soul. Sometimes when we have certain spiritual diseases and vices, how do I purify myself? Sadaqah. That's why the Quran says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Sadaqatan, what's the next word? What's after that? Tutahiruhum. Sahih? Tutahiruhum and what's after that? Watuzakihim. Take sadaqah from their from the, the Muslims, not just to help the poor, but they will benefit, the one that's giving, because this will spiritually cleanse them. This will spiritually edify their souls you're getting rid of the 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 vices that are inside you the spiritual vices so that's number one your the, the 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 spiritual spiritual remedy for your vices number two bala allah protects you from harm this is in the dunya in the akhirah allah says give me one dollar i'll give you back 700 times more you're not giving it for free you're gonna get a return 
Don't think that if I give a sadaqah, it's for free. No, you will get a return that's 700 times greater, if not more. So by helping a poor, who was the one that was really helped, benefited the most? Him who got $20 or until you got millions of hasanat on the Day of Judgment and in the dunya. Ana, ana sahab al fadl ana sahab al mustafid I am the one that benefited. So the Prophet tells his companions, who wants this opportunity? Look at it as an opportunity to jump on when someone asks you. Do not be, feel, some people, they're irritated when they're asked to help. This is a ni'mah that Allah brought to you. And that's why there's a hadith from, I believe, Imam al Hussein where he says, Hawa'ijun nasi ilaykum min na'amillahi alaykum. The fact that people come to you and ask you for help, this is a ni'mah. It's not a ni'mah, it's not a burden, it's a ni'mah. Because it may be because of this good act that Allah takes me to paradise. That tips the balance. So anyway, he asked them, who can help this ashab, uh, this Arabi? And look, he's giving them even more of a return. Not just the thawab, the normal thawab. No, 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 no. وَأَنَا أَضْمَنُ لَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ زَادِ التَّقْوَى And I will make sure, if you give this Arabi his zad, I will make sure that Allah gives you your zad. Now, which zad is Rasulullah speaking about here? He's speaking about the Zad that the Quran speaks about. Zadu Taqwa. The Zad of Taqwa, piety. The Quran, when it speaks about the Zad, what does it say? Watazawadu. Make sure that you collect Zad, meaning you have stocked what you need during your trip. Is the Quran saying when you travel to a city, make, take food with you? No. The Quran speaking about a different type of trip. The trip of the Akhirah. When we leave this dunya and we go to the next life, the grave, are we taking Zad with us or are we just going just with our kafan? I hope I'm not just taking my kafan to my grave. I hope I'm taking something with me. That something is ca called Zad. The Quran says, وَتَزَوَّدُوا Make sure you take from this dunya what will benefit you during the trip of the Akhirah. فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادُ Okay, what's the best Zad? What do I take with me? Money. Stock, my, my stocks, right? My belongings. The Quran says, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادَ التَّقْوَى Taqwa, piety. Which means God consciousness, fearing Allah and staying away from what angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obeying Allah. Taqwa is the best thing that will help us when we are entering our graves. And thus there's a hadith with Imam Ali alayhi salam where he took his companions to Wadi Salam in Najaf one day. Then the Imam began to speak to the dead. Why? Because he wanted to teach his companions a lesson. He told them, if you ask me about the akhbar, the news of this dunya, because you left, but you don't know what's going on in this world, I'll tell you, The money you left was distributed. The spouses you left moved on and got married again. And your homes, now other people are living in. Yeah, I mean, life continues. Don't think when you die, life stops. Some people think, if I die, khalas, the world is not going to function anymore. La habibi, it's the same thing the day after you die. Even if I'm a president of a country, two, three, four, five days, everyone will forget and life will continue. Life will not stop for any individual. So he tells them, it's the same stuff, don't worry. You're not missing out on anything. Whatever you saw when you were alive, that's the same stuff continuing. And then he said, هَذَا خَبَرُ مَا عِنْدَنَا فَمَا خَبَرُ مَا عِنْدَكُمْ This is our news, Ahlul Dunya, to you, Ahlul Barzakh, you that are six feet under. فَمَا خَبَرُ مَا عِنْدَكُمْ What news do you have for us? Yalla, I told you, I brought you news from the dunya, now bring me news from the Akhirah, from the grave, from the Barzakh, from the purgatory. Now can they reply? Oh, well, they're dead, they can't reply. So the Imam replied on their behalf. He looked at his companions, he said, Law udhina lahum bil jawab. They heard Imam Ali. Don't think that that person does not hear. The soul is there, it hears. When you go to the grave of a loved one, they hear everything you tell them. Many a hadith about this. He says, they heard me, but they cannot reply to me. Allah has not given them the power, the souls to speak to living human beings. If Allah gives them 
the permission to speak and answer my question, they would all give you one answer. What should I bring? You know, what's, what news do you have from, from the underground? لو أذن لهم بالجواب لقالوا إن خير الزاد التقوى. They would read this verse from the Quran. How many people is the Imam speaking to? Thousands of dead. How can they all give one answer? So if I ask you a question, I'll hear 20 answers. If I ask you, what's the most important verse in the Quran? Everyone will choose a verse. But when we die, we will all give the same answer. Inna khayr al-zad al-taqwa. Which shows taqwa is very important. Meaning, staying away from sins is more important than trying to just achieve good deeds. Why? Because your sins will burn your good deeds. Waste of time. That's why taqwa is very important, brothers and sisters. Staying away from haram. They destroy all our good deeds. The, the hard work. Quran says, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مِنْ ثُورًا Some people did so many good deeds. Allah will not count it for them. He says, because you had no taqwa. إِنَّمَا Listen to this verse. يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah will only accept your good deeds if you are from the muttaqeen. You have taqwa, piety. But if you want to continue to do haram and you do good deeds, Allah says, I don't, want it. I don't want your good deeds. Leave it for yourself. Stay away from haram, then do good deeds. Then do mustahabbat. Anyway. So, <clears throat> the Prophet says in that hadith, whoever helps the Sa'rabi, I will make sure Allah gives you your zad for the next life. Salman al-Farisi, he's listening, he's excited. He wants this, zad al-taqwa. Because are we, do we know that we will die with taqwa? It's not guaranteed. Is anyone, can anyone guarantee that they will die a muttaqi without sins? Of course not. But Rasulullah says, if you do this, I guarantee you, you'll die a muttaqi. Allah will protect you. So Salman wants this opportunity. So he comes up, he says, Ya Rasulullah, can you explain further? What do you mean? The Prophet says, yes. He says, everyone before they die, on those last seconds of their lives, Allah Azza wa Jal will inspire you to say the shahadatain. لَقَّنَكَ اللَّهِ شَهَادَةَ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ بِعَلَىٰ أَصْوَاتِكُمْ Allah will inspire you to say that. فَإِنْ أَنْتَ قُلْتَهَا If you're able to say it because you died with taqwa, then the Prophet says, لَقِيْتَنِي وَلَقِيْتُكِ You will see me, Rasulullah, when you die. I will take care of you when you die. Imagine, brothers and sisters, when we human beings die, that will be one of the most difficult days of our lives. And specifically when they place us in our grave, and night falls. Because when my family buries me, and they leave me, I'll be all alone. What will I feel? Lonely. That's why the first night when we bury a body, when we bury any human being, any Muslim, what do we do the first night? Salatul Wahsha. What is Wahsha? Loneliness. Why? Because he's all alone. For 80, 90, however years he lived, he was always surrounded by people and family. Now he's all by himself. Oh, he's going to feel lonely. Pray those two rak'ahs, gift it to him or to her. Allah will relieve some of that difficulty, some of the loneliness. Allah will comfort the heart. But however, there are some people who will never feel lonely. Those that die with taqwa, piety, the Prophet says, you will see me, I'll be with you. If Rasulullah is with you from the second you die until the hisab, until you know, when, where Allah decides where you're going to go, heaven or hell, are you going to feel lonely? Rasulullah is with you. Asan, I, I would want to die just to see Rasulullah. They told me right now, if you accept to die right now, khalas, we'll put you with Rasulullah. I'll sign right away. Because I, I can't guarantee maybe tomorrow, a year, five years from now. I don't know what will happen. Rasulullah will greet you. And when he greets you, he takes care of you. Ba'd. Shafa'ah. And there's a hadith that tells us Imam Ali also. Imam Ali will greet the believers. That's why he told one of his companions by the name of Al-Harith Al-Hamdani, Ya Hara Hamdan, Man Yamut Yarani. Whoever dies, they will see me. If you're a believer and you die, Amir al-Mu'mineen's holy face, 
you will see him smiling and he will tell you do not worry I will take care of you and everything will be okay <clears throat> so Salman now is so excited I want this because I want to die a mu'min I want taqwa throughout my life because there were some companions who had taqwa but they changed later they changed later unfortunately they gave up that taqwa for example as Zubair as Zubair ibn al-Awam was a pious man that loved Rasulullah that loved Imam Ali that defended Imam Ali but he died fighting against Imam Ali so his taqwa was temporary Salman wants the permanent taqwa that continues until death so he's excited but what's the problem he's broke he can't afford four or five whatever six meals for this Arabi he could barely afford his lunch or dinner but he was poor so he goes outside the masjid and he thinks who should I go to who can help me he goes to the houses of the wives of Rasulullah each one had a small house or room he asked all the nine wives they couldn't help him they didn't have anything then he starts to lose hope what do I do who can lend me something who can give me something everybody's broke like me you know when there's an economic crisis nobody really wants to help you because they have their own problems to worry about so as he's about to lose hope he remembers that there is one house he did not go to this house will never let you down the individuals that live in that bait the ahl ahl the fam the people of that bait ahlul bait right will never let you down and that is the house of fatima and ali i know he says if i go to fatima she will never tell me no she'll find a way to help me so that gives him so much hope and joy he goes to the house of fatima he knocks the door fatima answers for me who is this me salman what do you need he tells he tells her the story your father said whoever can help this arabi then he will receive zad taqwa and i don't have any food can you prepare some food for him please Fatima tells him, Ya Salman, I wish I can, but I don't have anything in the house. Nothing, zero. There is not one piece of food in the house. And in fact, she tells him, I'm starving. I haven't had food for three days and Hassan and Hussein are starving. Aslan, they can't move anymore because of how dehydrated and malnourished they are. So I'm sorry, I don't know what to give you. I don't have anything to give you. Salman, he feels so down. He feels as if... You know, if Fatima tells me no, but خلاص, all the doors are now, are now closed. There is nobody that can help me. Now, the question is, why was Fatima starving? Why didn't she have any food? And Hassan and Hussein are starving. And there's nothing in the house. The hadith of Ibn Abbas doesn't indicate. But however, if you put two hadiths together, I think you can come up with a very good conclusion, analysis. What's my analysis of this hadith? The reason why, it's an analysis, so it's not 100%. The reason why she was hungry for three days is because she gave her food for three days to people that were in need. What does that remind you of? Which story? Which verse? <laughs> Allah speaks about a group. Allah doesn't say who it is, but we know it's Ahlul Bayt. Imam Ali, Fatima, and Hassan Hussein. They're about to have their iftar. You know how hungry you are when you're having iftar? If someone touches your food, you'll punch them. I'll remind you in Ramadan if I see you, inshallah, before iftar. I'll ask you, can I have some of your food? And we'll see how you reply. But you're starving. What was their food? Each one had one loaf of bread. That's it. This was the food of Imam Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein. That's it. One bread for Ali, one for Fatima, one for Hassan, Hussein. Nothing else. And this is the greatest creation of Allah. That's how they lived. Did they earn their position for free, brothers and sisters? Can you live on a loaf of bread? I don't think so. We don't have that patience. We don't. And they were so thankful. Every single one of us, I can say this with full conviction, here lives a life, a materialistic life, yani financial life, that is way better than all of Ahlul Bayt. 
better than Rasulullah, better than Imam Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. Materialistically. The food that we eat, the houses that we have, the just the general life that we live is a thousand times better than Rasulullah, the greatest creation of Allah. Imam Ali, the second greatest. Fatima, what does that show you? Two things. Number one, if Allah loves you, He doesn't care about if you're rich or poor in this dunya. This dunya is worthless for Him. If this dunya and being rich was a way in which Allah tells you, I love you, then he hates Muhammad and al-Muhammad. Because even Prophet Muhammad sometimes had nothing to eat. We have traditions that sometimes he had to eat grass. In the beginning when he was teaching Islam and they boycotted him, the people of Mecca. Does Allah love him? Send him, he's your messenger. To Allah, this dunya is meaningless. If I had some financial difficulties, it's a, it's a short worth. Why is it called dunya? Dunya is from Adna, it means it's so low. Just pass your test. Go to the Akhirah, Allah says, I will pamper you there. That's number one. And number two, brothers and sisters, we have to be so thankful for Allah for the na'am that we have. Our refrigerators are exploding with food. Some of us have two or three refrigerators. We have a pantry room. We have so much food in our garages, right? Sometimes I'm driving by some houses. And I see their garages opened. Masha Allah, how much water they're stocking up. And I don't know, a thousand bottles. And you see they're stocking up on, I don't know, uh, grains, rice. Yeah, I mean, they have food for like three, four months. And Ahlul Bayt, they only had the meal for that day. Tomorrow's meal is not ready yet. Every day the meal comes. So anyway, the Quran says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامُ they're about to have their iftar, someone knocks the door. Imam Ali goes to the door. Who is it? Miskeen, the Quran says. Someone who's poor. I want food. Imam Ali says, sees that there's only food for us. There's nothing else. He talks to Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, and they all collectively decide to give their food to the miskeen. This is ithar. This is generosity. This is altruism. When you give what you want, what you need to someone else. This is selflessness. This is Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam And they go hungry. And they don't even know him. He's just a random faqir, random guy who's asking them for food. They say, it's okay, khalas, we'll be patient. We'll have, we will skip today's iftar and we'll have iftar tomorrow. Next day they're fasting again. They sit down to eat. Someone knocks the door. Who was it this time? Miskinan wa yatim. Yatim, an orphan, I want food. Once again, they give their food. Now it's two days, they had no food. The third day, which is the greatest of the virtues of al Bayt, they want to have their meal. Someone knocks the door. The Quran says, Wa asira. Now it's someone who was a prisoner of war, but he's been released. I want food. Imam Ali right away gives the food to him. And for three days, no food. Now what's, what many people miss on this word, the Asir, who was that Asir? Was he a Muslim? No. Why? Why would a Muslim be taken as a prisoner of war in the Muslim country? This is a prisoner of war in the beginning of Islam in Medina. If you're a Muslim, you're, why are you in the Muslim prisons? This shows you that prisoner of war was non-Muslim. Remember the Prophet, the Muslims had some battles with the people of Quraysh, the Mushrikeen, the idolaters, the polytheists, the pagans, with the Jews sometimes. So this person was a non-Muslim. He was either a Jew or a Mushrik. A Jew or a Mushrik comes to the house of Imam Ali and Fatima, Hassan Hussein. Three days they have not eaten. They give their food to this non-Muslim. Show me tolerance for others greater than this story, brothers and sisters. These are the stories that we have to tell non-Muslims. They tell us Islam is a religion that's violent, that's not tolerant toward, towards other religion. Show them the stories. This is Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein. Even with their people that were not on their religion, they gave their own food to them, not their extra food like we do. When we give sadaqah, it's extra, we don't need it. They gave their own food and they starved for three days. Which shows us, brothers and sisters, if we are followers of Ahlul Bayt, we claim to be Shia of Ahlul, Imam Ali. 
then we should not have this mentality. I call it aqliyat al Some individuals, unfortunately, they will only sympathize and help individuals that are suffering in need if they are from their village. If it's the village across, shukhasni fihum. Or their country. If it's the next country, shukhasni fihum. Is this Islam? Is this Ahlul Bayt? No. You can do that, but don't say I'm Shia. Shia yani follower. Ahlul Bayt, mish fakat yani it's uh, the country. Even the religion didn't matter. The religion didn't matter. What does that show you? Are we really Shia? Do we really follow Ahlul Bayt? Or we've created our own system. I'm from this village, I'm from this country, and I will help people from this country. Other countries, even though they're Shia or they're Muslims, even if non-Muslims, I'll give them crumbs. Or else I don't even care. I hear a flood, for example, in, in somewhere in Africa. They're human beings at the end of the day. If you can help, everywhere. So anyway, this is the verse that Allah speaks about. Allah praises them for this act of altruism, that they gave their food for three days. Allah brings out the verse, He says, We're doing this for Allah. We don't want any recognition. We don't want anyone to come and thank us and praise us and put our names on the walls. and Abadan. We're doing this only for Allah. They did it for Allah. Allah mentioned it in the Quran. When you do something only for Allah, you don't want anyone to know, Allah will make sure people will know. And you won't lose the thawab. Versus someone who gives and donates for the recognition. You will lose the thawab. You will not receive any thawab. So anyway, going back to the story of Fatima, why did she tell Salman, I'm starving? I believe this is the continuation of that story. So it's the third day. They've given their food for the third day. Salman comes at the worst time. They're starving and he wants food from them. But the hadith doesn't indicate it, but I think this, this is a good analysis. It makes sense. So Salman sees Fatima doesn't have anything. He also feels des you know, desperate. He feels hopeless. Now Fatima tells me no, but خلاص, who's going to help me? But Fatima could never say no to anyone. She didn't want to tell him no. So she thought of an idea. She said, you know what, Salman, I can't tell you no. Allahu Akbar, look at to what extent she's willing to go just to help people. And she's starving herself. And her kids are starving. She said, I just have one extra dress. I'll give you this dress. Go to someone by the name of Shamoon. He was a Jew in Medina. He was wealthy. He had a grocery store. Go and give him this dress as a wadi'a, as a a bond, you know, like a security bond, as a, like a mortgage where, you know, just in case we don't pay you back, you can take the dress. Tell him, the daughter of Rasulullah says, take my dress as a bond and lend us some food and we'll pay you back later. And if we didn't pay you back, hope you have the dress, go and sell it and you'll get the money from that. Salman is happy, there's a solution. He takes the dress of Fatima, he goes to that Jewish man. He gives him the dress, what's going on? This is the daughter of our prophet. He says, what does she want? She wants some food. She wants uh, wheat and dates. He says, for her? Salman tells him, no. For a random guy that I asked help. He says, she, she wants food for, she's giving her dress as a mortgage just so she can buy food for a stranger. Salman says, not just that. And she's starving, by the way. And she's starving. Allahu Akbar. What do you say about this, brothers and sisters? Have you ever in your life heard someone takes a loan, takes out a mortgage to help someone else while he is in need? I have never heard of any individual throughout my life doing that. Only Ahlul Bayt. Know why they are Ahlul Bayt. Know why Allah loves them so much. Because they did things no human being can even imagine doing. The level of generosity and selflessness and altruism. So anyway, Shamoon, the hadith says, began to cry. His, this Jewish man who doesn't even believe in Ahlul Bayt, he began to cry because he was so moved. Her children are, don't have food and she's thinking about strangers. What type of selfless individual is this? He tells him, Subhanallah, we read in our books from Musa, 
are Jewish books that there will be some individuals that will come years, thousands of years after Musa, and they will show this level of altruism. I had never seen this until now. So he quickly gets three kilograms of wheat and three kilograms of dates, which is worthless for us now. Right, probably $20, $25. Fatima has to take a mortgage out for $20, $25. alhamdulillah. We are drowning in the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And still we complain. And we, have, we find it difficult to sometimes give charity and donate. While Fatima had zero and she still found ways to, to help. So <clears throat> he takes the, the food, the, the wheat and the dates. He comes to the house of Fatima. He's so happy he gives it to her. Fatima bakes the, the wheat into bread. And she prepares a beautiful tray filled with bread and dates enough for like seven eight meals salman sees it looks so nice he says yeah fatima take some for hassan and hussein just a bit fatima says no i can't he says why they're starving there's this so much food she says because i made another a vow to allah i have vowed this for allah when i make another and I vow something for Allah, I can never go back on my vow. I can never take anything back. And that's why I go to Surah Al-Insan, What does Allah say in the verse before that? This is, I think, verse 8. What does Allah say in verse 7? Allah says, one of the, one of the qualities of these people that they give their you know, food three days in a row to Miskin Yati Masir, Allah says, يُوفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ when they vow something for Allah, they fulfill. When they promise to give something for Allah, they fulfill their promise. Even if it means they starve. This is Ahlul Bayt So Salman takes the tray, he goes to the masjid of Rasulullah. He shows Rasulullah this beautiful tray. Rasulullah is surprised. Where did Salman get this beautiful food? He knows Salman is broke. He tells him, where did you get this from? Because I got it from your daughter Fatima alayhi salam. Fatima gave you all this? Where'd she get it from? So Rasulullah leaves. He goes to the house of Fatima. He knocks the door. He asks for permission to go inside. Even Rasulullah would ask permission to go to the house of his daughter. And he would knock the door every time. Just doesn't just barge in. Because this is not an ordinary house. This is the house of Sayyidah Tunisa al-Alameen. So... Fatima alayhi salam, Rasulullah enters. He's, the hadith says he noticed the face of Fatima is so pale, yellow, because she has not eaten anything and her eyes have fallen back into their sockets. I've seen people who are very dehydrated, their eyes, as they change. Their, the, 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 their body, their color, everything, you know, just doesn't look right. So he asked Fatima, what's going on? What happened? He tells her, she tells him, I haven't had anything for three days, Ya Rasulullah, I have no energy. Hassan Hussein have no energy. Rasulullah is so upset. He sits down. He puts Imam Hassan on his right lap, Imam Hussein on his left lap. He tells, oh Fatima, come and sit next to me. And then Imam Ali comes in the house. He says, oh Ali, come and sit behind me. And then Rasulullah raises his hand and he says, Ilahi wa Sayyidi wa Mawla, Ya Allah. This is my Ahlul Bayt. Ya Allah, I want you to purify them and keep away all impurities from them. The hadith, once again, doesn't say, but I believe this is one hadith, the hadith of um, uh, hadith al Kisa. Yes, Ayat al Tatheer. This is when Ayat al Tatheer came down. Where Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِرَ The Quran says, Allah wants to purify you, Ahl al-Bayt, and to keep all impurities away from you. The Prophet says, هَأُولَاءِ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ This is my family. Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and Fatima. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse replying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibn Abbas says, as after that Fatima went to a corner, and she prayed two rak'ahs to Allah and she did her dua. She said, Ya Allah, Bani Israel, they asked you to bring down food from the heavens and you did so. But even though they saw food coming down from the heavens, they disbelieved. 
She's either referring to Bani Israel during the time of Musa, where Allah says, Anzalna or Nazalna alaykumul manna wa salwa, two types of food that were brought down from paradise, yet they went back to worshiping the calf. Or she may be referring to Bani Israel, meaning some of the uh, people that followed Jesus, Isa, because they were also considered Bani Israel. There's a verse in the Quran where Allah says, Jesus, Isa spoke to Allah and he said, قَالَ عِيسَى رَبْ اللَّهُمَّ رَبَّنَا أَنزِلْ عَلَيْنَا مَائِدَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ تَكُونُ لَنَا عِيدًا لِأَوَّلِنَا وَآخِرَنَا وَآيَةً مِنْكَ He said, oh Allah, bring down a meal from heaven for everyone so that people first of all have a feast and so that it's a miracle. So they see a miracle and they believe. The traditions t tell us that some people, they saw the miracle, they saw food from heaven, they ate, but yet they disbelieved. So Fatima is saying, Ya Allah, Bani Israel asked you for food from the heavens, you gave it to them and they disbelieved. We are the family of Rasulullah. We're asking you for a, a meal from paradise. And I promise you, we will not disbelieve. We will believe even more. We will thank you even more. Ibn Abbas says, as soon as she said these words, Allah Azza wa Jal brought down a majestic meal from paradise. A meal that we cannot imagine how great it is. Ibn Abbas says the fragrance, the smell of that meal was so strong and beautiful. Everyone in the city of Medina smelled it. Yani maybe even a kilometer away. What type of food is this? Food of Jannah ba'd. Food of Jannah is not like the food. Food of dunya maximum, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40 feet. If you're having a very, very nice Lahammashwi barbecue, maybe it's a, it's a bit more, right? It's the whole city, this is from paradise. So it comes down upon Fatima. She carries the tray. She takes it to Rasulullah. She places it in front of him. He says, what is this? She tells him, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah thanks Allah. He says, ya Allah, I thank you that you gave me a daughter like Maryam. What is he referring to? كُلَّمَا دَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا زَكَرِيَّ الْمِحْرَابِ وَجَدَ عِنْدَهَا رِزْقًا قَالَ يَا مَرْيَمُ أَنَّا لَكِ هَذَا قَالَتْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Every Quran says every time Zakariya would come and see Maryam, he was either the uncle or the, the, uh, the, the husband of her aunt, he would see there's food, there's food that he knows she didn't buy, so it's not even available in, in the stores. Where did you get this, O oh Maryam? She says, from Allah. Allah would bring, brings me, Maryam, my food. So he thanked Allah that he gave him a daughter like Maryam. That she asked Allah for food from heavens and Allah brings it down. This hadith, brothers and sisters, shows you why Fatima was so great. This hadith shows you why Fatima alayhi salam was so dear to Allah azza wa jal. Why she was Sayyida to Nisa al-Alameen. You see her altruism? You see her selflessness? She never thought about herself. It was always about others before me. Even when she did dua, Imam Al-Hasan says, I saw her one day, she did dua for everyone except herself. I asked her, my dear mother, you didn't do dua for yourself. She said, Bunayya al-jar, thumma dar Think about your neighbor before you think about yourself. And she ultimately gave even her life for Islam and for Allah. When Rasulullah died and she saw Imam Ali is sidelined, who was the greatest supporter of Amir al Mu'mineen? It was Fatima alayhi salam. She went to Imam Ali, she told him, Yabn al Am, do not be worried. I will support you until my last breath. Rasulullah appointed you, and I will stop at nothing to make sure that you are the leader of the Muslims. That's why. Fatima went to the masjid of Rasulullah and she gave the beautiful sermon of Fadak. I encourage you to read it. It's in English. It's so eloquent and beautiful. It's like Nahjul Balagha. Alhamdulillahi ala ma alham. Alhamdulillahi ala ma an'am. Wa thana'u bima qaddam. Min umumi ni'amin ibtadaha. Wa subuqi ala'in asdaha. Wa tamami minanin wa laha. Jamma alil ihsai adaduha. It's so beautiful. There's a rhyme and it's filled with meanings. She begins by praising Allah. She then mentions Rasulullah's favor upon them and then she reminds them of the favors of Imam Ali over them. She says, this Ali that you've sidelined, that you don't like now, if it wasn't for him, you, none of you would be Muslims. Because in Badr, Uhud, Khanda, Khaybar, who was the one that saved you? It was Ali. This is how you betray him? This is what you do now? If it wasn't for Ali, Asan, you would never, you would all be dead right now. Why do you hate Ali? 
What's the animal? Why is there animosity? And then she gave the answer. She says, Why were they uneasy with Imam Ali becoming the Khalifa? She says, Because he was so strong, there was that envy that Ali was always in the, had the spotlight. Imam Ali, when it came to haqq, when it came to truth, he did not care about anything else. He never negotiated. He never compromised. And some people don't like that. They want you to bend the rules sometimes. So that's why they don't want Ali. They want someone that may what? Someone that may be willing to give them special status, to give them what they want versus no, just follow the rules, follow the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they don't like Imam Ali. Envy. And number two, because he's too strict. He follows the Islam 100%. And no one dared to reply to her. She gave that sermon. She went back home. They re now, then she started to mobilize some of the Sahaba. Our hadith tell, to, tell us she was able to mobilize 40 of the Sahaba of Rasulullah. Weren't she went to their houses? Weren't you there in Ghadir? Didn't you see Imam Ali's hands? What happened all of a sudden now? Why are you staying home? 40 Sahaba. They said, okay, we will come. And we will join Imam Ali. Imam Ali told them, okay, tomorrow, meet me at noon, for example, in this place. Come with your head shaven so that I know you're serious, that you're ready to die. How many people show up the next day? Four. One hadith says four, one hadith says five. Fatima says, I'll try again. She goes to those 40 people. You didn't come. They started to making, make, making excuses. For example, yeah, you know what? I was petting my camel. I was busy doing this, I was busy, I forgot, whatever. There's a hadith I saw, some of them, they told Fatima, it's too late. We already gave our bay'ah to someone else. You should have came earlier. Three times Fatima went. They said, okay, they promised, but they never showed up. They never showed up, only four. This is when Imam Ali realized, four is not enough for an uprising. But Fatima continued. They saw her as the opposition, that's why they decided to take her out. They came to the house of Fatima. Oh Ali, come out. Oh Ali, come out. For hours. Imam Ali is writing the tafsir of the Quran as he was ordered by Rasulullah. They knock the door. Fatima comes behind the door. She never opened the door. Behind the door, she told them, leave us alone. We are crying for Rasulullah. Respect the fact that we are in a mourning period. But unfortunately, instead of respecting the fact that she's the daughter of Rasulullah, the house was raided. The door that Jibra'il would ask permission. The Prophet would not enter without permission. They entered the house of Fatima. And as soon as they noticed her be between the door and the wall, this is when Fatima was crushed between the wall and the door. And that's why Sulaim ibn Qais, one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who was not in Medina, after he this incident, he came back, he heard of such an incident that some individuals raided the house of Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, a few days after he died. He was in shock. So he asked Salman al-Farisi, what did he tell him? قَالَ قُلْتُ يَا سلمان هل دخلوا ولم يكن استئذان سليم أ سلمان أو سلمان please tell me what I am hearing is not true please tell me that they didn't ambush the house of فاطمة what did Salman tell him? قال وعزة الجبار وما على الزهراء من خمار he says yes everything you heard is true unfortunately they raided the house of Fatima and what's even worse is that Fatima was not wearing her hijab لكنها لاذت وراء الباب رعاية 
تسل الستر والحجاب When Fatima noticed that they are opening the door She hid between She hid behind the door When they noticed that she is behind the door فمذ رأوها عصروها عصرا كادت بنفسي أن تموت حسرا They squeezed her between the wall and the door فنادت يا فضة سنديني فقد ورد بي أسقط ما في أحشائي She cried, she cried out, O oh, Fidda, the servant, O oh, Fidda, come to me For I have miscarried my child فأسقط يات بنت الهدى وحزنا جنين هذا كالمسلم محسنا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين Brothers and sisters, let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us let us ask through Fatima alayhi salam the door of Fatima never closes let us seek the intercession of Fatima and do tawassul to Allah Azza wa Jal through Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam you've all memorized this part of dua at tawassul let's read it together Ya Sayyidatana wa Mawlatana يا فاطمة بنت رسول الله يا سيدة نساء العالمين We turn to you, O oh فاطمة, for our hajat There are many of us that have hajat, that have needs, that are sick We ask you, O oh فاطمة, to ask Allah Azza wa Jal To cure anyone that is sick, anyone that has a hajat, grant them their hajat Let us read together Inna tawassalna wastashfa'na wa tawassalna biki ila Allah وَقَدَّمْنَاكِ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ حَاجَاتِنَا Now everyone read together. يَا وَجِيهَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ اشْفَعِي لَنَا يَا وَجِيهَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ اشْفَعِي لَنَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ يَا اللَّهُ We ask you through the love of Fatima alayhi salam the position and status of Fatima we ask you to accept our amal to forgive us of our deeds to grant us our hajat cure anyone that is sick we ask you to hasten the reappearance of our mawla sahib al-asri wa zaman grant us the ziyarah of ahlul bayt in this life their shafa'ah in the next life and let us recite surah al-fatiha for all the mu'mineen and mu'minat that have departed us after a loud salawat for Muhammad in Al Muhammad.